Hola a todos, soy Alicia Silva, la presidenta actual de SUME, y estoy aquí muy contenta y quiero darles la bienvenida a todos a este Lead Innovators, el primero de este 2022. Eh, es un placer tener esta participación del GBCI y esta asociación que siempre nos lanza muchísimo a subir esta calidad de los webinars y nos ayuda a enriquecer muchísimo nuestra comunidad. Y el día de hoy tenemos una expositora maravillosa y voy a dejar que Nicolette de el GBCI nos presente. Bienvenida Nicolette, bienvenida Karima. Muchísimas Adelante. gracias, Alicia. ¿Me escucha bien, no? Muy bien. Muy bien. Ok, pues muchísimas gracias. Yo soy Nicolette Bonet, soy la directora de Desarrollo de Mercados Globales para Latinoamérica y el Caribe para USGBC y GBCI. Y es un gusto estar con ustedes y con Sumo y hoy para dar la patada inicial de la serie de Lead Innovators en el 2022, en el que en alianza con Sume estaremos tocando temas importantes de la, de la actualidad del desarrollo del mercado mexicano. Y es un gusto para mí para comenzar con uno de los temas más relevantes y que sabemos ayudará mucho a nuestros edificios, comunidades, infraestructura, a sobrevivir y prosperar, y porque hemos titulado nuestro episodio de hoy El Camino de la Resiliencia. Y la resiliencia, al igual que la sostenibilidad, no es un estado estatístico, estático, sino que describe la funcionalidad de un sistema dado. Sistemas como nuestra sociedad, la economía, la salud pública y el medio ambiente al nivel macro, por ejemplo, y también sistemas muy personales e individuales al respecto de nuestras vidas, hogares y escuelas y negocios. En cada eso, estamos buscando la forma de anticipar los riesgos, prepararnos para responder en un momento de crisis y sobre todo de adapt cómo adaptarnos para el futuro. Y no solo es manejar el riesgo para evitar un impacto negativo, sino que un plan de resiliencia también puede traducirse en mayores ingresos netos de operación en un edificio al tiempo que aumenta el protege el valor. Y un enfoque en la resiliencia es lo que importa mucho a los inversionistas y clientes. Y los edificios LEED son un parte fundamental para mejorar la, resi la resiliencia de un entorno construido. El día de hoy tenemos el gusto de tener con nosotros Kurima Sulim, que desempeña como especialista LEED, Sitios Sostenibles y Progreso Integrativo. Kurima apoya una amplia experiencia en diseño arquitectónico, gestión de proyectos, construcción sostenible y política ambiental. En su cargo actual, Kurima supervisa el desarrollo técnico de las categorías de créditos de sitios sostenibles y progreso integrativo para los sistemas de certificación LEED y brinda apoyo técnico para la equidad social, la adaptación al clima y las estrategias de infraestructura resiliente. La cartera de proyectos de Kurima incluye documentación LEED y gestión de proyectos, documentación de construcción y diseño de labor laboratorios y otros espacios de educación superior, gestión de programas de sostenibilidad, informes sobre clima y energía y estudios ecológicos. En su función actual como experta en temas de sitios sostenibles y progreso integrativo, Kurima apoya el desarrollo de sistemas de certificación mediante la gestión de varios proyectos en categorías de créditos sitios sostenibles relacionados con las guías de referencia LEED, la educación, la documentación y así como los créditos pilotos de resiliencia y cuidad social. Kurima tiene una maestría en estudios ambientales de la Universidad de Pennsylvania con una concentración en política ambiental y una licenciatura de diseño de interiores de la Universidad de Drexel. Kurima es un miembro de la Comité de Justicia, Equidad, Diversidad e Inclusión Social de la Sociedad de Profesionales de la Adaptación y es miembro de la Asociación Americana de la Planeación y miembro del Estudio Instituto Americano de Arquitectos. Ella es la facilitadora del Grupo Asesor Técnico de Sitios Sostenibles de USGBC y el Grupo de Trabajo de Equidad Social. Antes de dar la palabra a Kurima, les recuerdo por favor que la asistencia y participación en este webinar representa una hora de educación continua para los profesionales de LEED y el número de curso está en la pantalla hoy. Y quiero pedir para reducir interrupciones que apagamos nuestros micrófonos y cámaras para no distraer a nuestra invitada. Y por favor, les invito a usar el chat para sus preguntas para que al final sean respondidas por nuestra invitada de hoy. Y sin más palabras, um, voy, a, voy a dar la palabra a Kurima 
Akarima, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Please go ahead. Gracias. Thank you so much, Nicolette. I'm going to share my screen now, and hopefully it works okay. Can everyone see my screen all right? Legit. Great. Yeah, no, no, we do. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you all so much for having me today. Um, my name is Karima Salim, as you heard. I'm a lead specialist at the US Green Building Council uh, in Washington, DC. And my role, uh, I serve as the resilience and social equity expert on the lead technical development team. And thank you for joining our webinar today where we will explore the topic of resilience. <clears throat> resilience is a hot topic on the minds of local leaders these days, uh, whether it's a mountain town battling droughts and wildfires or a coastal community responding to rising sea levels, communities are increasingly aware of the importance of preparing for and adapting to changing conditions. So it's important not just to be able to bounce back quickly after a crisis, but to recover in a way that increases sustainability and quality of life for all residents. The US Green Building Council or uh, USGBC is working to transform the way buildings and communities are designed, built and operated to encourage sustainable, equitable and resilient practices around the globe. So resilience, much like sustainability is not a static state, but instead is a descriptor of the functionality of a given system. So acknowledging that both returning to an existing state following a disaster or major event and thus building towards a new, more adapted state are important elements of community resilience. Uh, acknowledging that USGBC adopted the following definition. Resilience is the ability to prepare and plan for, absorb, recover from, and more successfully adapt to adverse events. An important step in operationalizing this definition of resilience in respect to both single events and long-term stresses is to establish a robust baseline of ongoing resilience efforts and, underlying, and the underlying social, natural, and economic functions of community systems. So USGBC Center for Resilience provides tools and resources that support the LEED Green Building Rating System and capture this idea uh, and much of what is needed to be a resilient community. LEED or Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design is USGBC's third party verification system for green buildings at all scales from private homes to large commercial skyscrapers. LEED criteria can be applied to new or existing buildings and offers four rating, uh, system, rating levels based on points gained for energy, water, waste, materials, transportation, human health, and other categories. LEED's the most widely used green building rating system in the world and an international symbol of excellence. LEED buildings are a critical part of addressing climate change, enhancing resilience, and supporting more equitable communities. LEED project teams attest that the LEED process, including purposeful design and third-party validation has helped projects achieve critical resilience outcomes. Lead credits are designed with resilience at the forefront to help projects avoid damage, reduce risk, and protect systems infrastructure. In fact, a, a University of Texas San Antonio study found that most LEED V4 credits help to increase resilience among several natural disasters. They found that 64% of lead credits and prerequisites enhance resilience of buildings against uh, flooding. 63% of lead credits and prerequisites enhance resilience of buildings against hurricanes and typhoons. 61% of lead credits and prerequisites enhance resilience of buildings against tsunamis. But don't just take their word for it, try it yourself. Uh, the lead climate resilience tool for LEED v4 projects offer a, a framework to help identify climate related effects on projects and to determine effective strategies for enhancing resilience. The tool helps project teams by evaluating the resilience potential of each credit and identifying potential opportunities. So speaking of tools, 
Uh, ARC is our state-of-the-art platform that collects, manages, and benchmarks lead building data to improve sustainability and resilience performance. Um, so you can find ARC on our website. And late in 2020, USGBC announced a collaboration with Coastal Risk Consulting. Um, integration of risk footprint with Lead Online and ARC will give any project new tools to assess vulnerability to risks. So through integrative design and key credits, LEAD guides uh, project teams to invest in climate adaptation strategies to enhance building and community resilience. LEAD buildings are driving resilience enhancing designs, technologies, materials, and methods by integrating practices such as the use of durable materials, thoughtful site selection, rainwater collection, demand response, grid islanding, maximal energy efficiency, on-site renewable energy generation, and more. This is because LEED explicitly promotes resilient practices by means of its prerequisites and credits, some of which are listed here, including site assessment, rainwater management, heat island reduction, and sensitive land protection. So much like our certified resilient buildings, LEED's development process ensures it remains flexible and adaptable to market changes. Uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists defined the resilience gap shown here on the left uh, as the degree to which a community is unprepared for damaging climate related events. In LEED version 4.1, LEED's newest version, we integrated changes to the rating system that would help project teams fill that gap by focusing on more adaptation strategies in addition to the mitigation measures already in place and really looking towards the future uh, and setting our, our thresholds and, and performance requirements. So for example, in version 4.1 integrated process, we added a site selection and social equity sections to the list of areas to analyze. Uh, in the rainwater management credit, we added new exemplary performance threshold, which takes future precipitation rates into account. And then in the credit protect or restore habitat, we added new requirements for uh, pollinator gardens in order to attract um, more insects to urban areas. So LEED's series of resilient design pilot credits are available to all new construction projects seeking to certify through LEED V4 or version 4.1. While typically earned as part of a project's initial design phase, these pilot credits can be achieved at any time during the LEED process for new construction projects. So uh, LEED Pilot Credit 98, Assessment and Planning for Resilience, encourages project teams to determine potential vulnerabilities at the project location. To earn the credit, project teams must identify risks related to the effects of climate change. Risks that must be considered as part of this credit include sea level rise, extreme heat, and more intense winter storms. Lead Pilot Credit 99, Designing for Enhanced Resilience, ensures that the risk-related information collected as mandated by credit uh, pilot credit 98 is taken into account via mitigation measures. The credit states that project teams must address either one or two of the top hazard risks identified with one point available for each. This tiered approach allows teams to earn acknowledgement for mitigating multiple types of risks. Lead pilot credit 100, passive survivability and backup power during disruptions centers around the concept that buildings should be able to safely shelter occupants during a power outage, as well as be able to provide backup power. And this credit is designed to support maintenance of safe thermal conditions in the event of an extended power outage or loss of heating fuel through passive survivability, which means maintaining a livable temperature for an extended period of time without active systems and or backup power for critical loads. Currently, nearly 400 projects have registered to pursue the credits. 
Um, and those pilot credits are still open and available to any project team today. <clears throat> so here's an example of a LEED certified project that has been tested and has demonstrated exceptional resilience. Um, originally built in the early 20th century, the building that is home to the offices of Alvarez, Diaz, and Villon, uh, AD and V, has renovated to maximize sustainability and resilience in 2014. Uh, they earned LEED Platinum certification. Uh, the resilient features of both the office space and the building contributed to its quick recovery from Hurricane Maria in 2017. Uh, so the offices located in uh, Port Puerto Rico, following the devastation of Hur Hurricane Maria, the office space returned to a fully functional workspace within a few days, um, a feat not typical in the area at the time. And because of this quick recovery, the office also served as a community gathering place and a temporary command center. Um, critical features of the project include a backup power generator and satellite internet, which reduced reliance on ground infrastructure. And that was heavily damaged following Hurricane Maria. Um, air conditioning units with 20 SEER rating minimizes energy consumption and thus facilitating uh, running cooling operations off the generator. Solar tube lighting enables people to work without the need for electricity by using natural light. Uh, lighting control systems minimize energy use, helping reduce the load on the generator. A rainwater cistern allows occupants access to running water when municipal systems are compromised. And the location in a dense area of the city enabled many workers to walk to work or use non-motorized transportation when vehicles were compromised. So it's a really great example of a, a resilient project in the face of um, adversity. So let's talk about Mexico. Uh, Mexico has long been a leader in LEED certification. It was recognized in 2019 uh, to be the eighth country in gross square meters uh, LEED certified projects and has certified 232 projects since then. So that's December 2020 to July 2021. Um, so it's the eighth uh, country for LEED certification and U.S. Green Building Council released uh, in 2019 the top 10 countries and regions for LEED. So you can check that out. Um, we can provide a link in the chat to learn more. Mexico is also home to six LEED projects that registered for the LEED Resilience Pilot Credits. Um, for the assessment and planning for, res uh, for resilience pilot credit, we had one core and gel project. For the designing for enhanced resilience pilot credit, we had two new construction projects. And for passive survivability and backup power during disruptions, uh, we have three new construction projects. And here is one example of a resilient lead project in Mexico. So UNARTE is a lead platinum project in Puebla, Mexico. Uh, it was designed by AKF Group with the university's commitments to education and art in mind. The project team incorporated elements that made the project more resilient. And for example, by including native, native vegetation on site and a rainwater infiltration system, UNARTE harvests, reuses, and treats 100% of the rainwater that falls on site. <clears throat> so within LEED, the LEED rating system, we, not only, we do not only look at uh, individual buildings, but we also look at cities and communities. And the LEED for Cities and Communities rating system is a pilot certification program that supports progress towards better, more resilient cities. Uh, it's available through the ARC performance platform. The LEED for Cities uh, rating system also goes further than the building scale and provides cities with solutions for measuring and managing energy and water use, human experience, waste production, 
and transportation usage on a city scale. Um, in 2019, the U.S. Green Building Council published Measuring Resilience, a guide to measuring community resilience with LEED v4.1 for cities and communities. Now, this guide supports local leaders seeking guidance for measuring and improving community resiliency. Using the newest version of LEED, this document identifies resilience strategies and best practices within the LEED for Cities and Communities rating system for existing cities. The guide utilizes a resilience framework developed by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. Therefore, communities in the United States that are already tracking their metrics and progress using LEED for Cities and Communities can use the guide to further align their efforts with existing national and state level emergency management assessment and reporting uh, structures. And for um, global uh, communities and projects, they can look to the measuring resilience uh, guide for a guide in general on how to measure community resilience uh, within cities. At the U.S. Green Building Council, we recognize that sustainability, resilience, and social equity go hand in hand. Um, we say that sustainability without equity is sustaining inequity, after all. Uh, now, social equity means uh, uh, equal opportunity and access, um, and in our strategic planning guidelines, the U.S. Green Building Council stated that we will continue to respect all communities and cultures and aspire to be a fully inclusive movement that embraces opportunities which broaden and expand our reach through partnerships and initiatives. Again, by equity, we mean equal opportunity in a safe and healthy environment and we seek to address disparities and inequitable distributions of goods, services, and amenities. And that's why we've included a series of social equity credits in the LEED rating system to uh, address this. Um, the social equity pilot credits include social equity within the project team, um, social equity within the community, and social equity within the supply chain. Other equity-related credits include housing types and affordability, visitability and universal design, community outreach and involvement, prevention through design, and integrative process for health promotion. Uh, now, some of those other equity-related credits that I listed uh, are pilot credits, and some of them are credits within the uh, Lead for Neighborhood Development rating system. And some of them are also included in the um, LEED uh, Innovation Catalog, which means other rating systems can pursue those credits. Uh, I also included on the right here the LEED Project Team Checklist for Social Impact. So uh, project teams can use that checklist as a tool uh, at the beginning of the design process to see how they can address um, disparities and how they can address the uh, frontline communities and, and uh, how to uh, address resilience concerns in these communities. Uh, now, we all know that we are in a new normal now, which means we, uh, as LEAD, uh, ha have to consider assisting building teams during the COVID-19 pandemic. So most recently to do that, to assist teams during the pandemic, USGBC introduced the LEED Safety First pilot credits to further address critical building operations and planning across cities and communities. Now, the Safety First pilot credit for social equity and pandemic planning encourages resilience for all by requiring project teams to consider equity implications while identifying risks and vulnerabilities and assessing pandemic preparedness and response. So the intent of that pilot credit is to systematically consider 
equity implications across all phases of the pandemic preparedness, planning and response process. Requirements include having in place a local equity officer, convening a pandemic community advisory group, uh, public communications, outreach programs, and educational campaigns, uh, impact analysis on policy decisions and operational procedures, um, adopting supportive policies, and providing emergency services, infrastructure, and or facilities to meet priority needs. And again, this pilot credit is available uh, for project teams now. Now in Lead for Cities, we included the quality of life category. This category encourages leaders to assess their socioeconomic and demographic conditions and make improvements to their communities that support education, prosperity, uh, income equality and social equity, uh, public health and environmental justice, human rights and community engagement. Uh, so this includes prerequisite uh, for demographic assessment, a prerequisite for quality of life performance, the credit trend improvements, the credit distributional equity, the credit environmental justice, uh, housing and transportation affordability, civic and community engagement, and civil and human rights. So as you can see here, uh, just even by the list of credits, the uh, how much equity and resilience go hand in hand when considering um, how to address uh, safety concerns for frontline communities and communities that experience these disasters. Now, USGBC has done all of this because our vision is that buildings and communities will regenerate and sustain the health and vitality of all life within a generation because the US Green Building Council wants to ensure that we are all in. So thank you for the time. Uh, you can reach out to our team today to get started with LEED version 4.1. You can visit us at www.usgbc.org or please uh, feel free to email me with more information. And I am happy to take questions now. Hola a todos. Eh, vamos a estar viendo si ustedes tienen alguna pregunta en el, en el chat. Y si no, voy a adelantarme y hacerle algunas preguntas a Karima. Karima, um, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, it, I think not a lot of people know all these things about LEED. Some people think that we're not focused on resilience and we don't have a, a, a aspect on social equity. Like, we would like to know, how have you seen the projects take advantage of this? Like, do people really ask? Do we need to make more um, information available? Or how can we encourage more teams to use these credits? That, that, is, a, my question. that is a great question, Alicia. Thank you for asking that. Um, so uh, the, the, the thing about pilot credits is that, you know, there's a lot to choose from. So uh, it's, uh, you know, it can be, it, it's, it's, it can be, you know, difficult to navigate sometimes as a project team. Um, but there are plenty of uh, pilot credits that focus on social equity and resilience. Um, so the pilot credit library is a really great tool for project teams to look um, and, and it's really, uh, we've made it a lot easier to look for credits within the pilot credit library that meet those needs. Um, and in terms of, you know, project teams that have leveraged this, we have, um, there was a project in Colorado uh, that built a health facility um, and they really wanted to engage the community to see what their, uh, because the community, it, the surrounding community was a lower income community um, and 
they wanted to meet the needs of those that community so they engage them at the beginning of the design process and that's really a key uh in terms of like how to you know pursue social equity and resilience is to engage the community at the start, the onset of design and when they were able to do that and and figure out what the needs of the community are um you know they uh were able to create uh, local food production on site and uh, provide resources for the community in terms of job training, uh, in terms of um, food, in terms of networking with, with local community leaders so that the community can get jobs. Um, all of these things that um, make a community resilient um, and uh, come like that is why community engagement is so important so that you can while you address the needs you're also preparing the community uh in the future by becoming uh, more independent and um more regenerative and supportive of the surrounding community i hope that answered your question so thank you yes no definitely and, and i think it this ties very well to the other question that rebecca posted where mm -hmm. she was wondering how do we change our typical mindset to design buildings and communities that are more resilient? But I think what you are saying here is that we have to put that as our main priority from the beginning. You know, right. from our um, integrated design process, we can say resilience is part of our plan and just putting it there. And but you know, in Mexico, especially in Mexico City, we also have a lot of earthquakes. And we have noticed that the Mexico City people already know what to do when an earthquake right. happened and immediately, you know, things come to mind and you know how to, you know, evacuate a building and things like that. So, mm -hmm. you know, how do we also think of other um emergencies like that like we have so many terrible things happen in mexico city that resilience is very much in our mind but just for earthquakes but what are the things that you're anticipating with climate change that we should also be prepared for in changing this mind and you know all these COVID situation has challenged us in very different ways like what are the things that uhbc is foreseeing that we should also prepare not only you know, maybe flooding and things, but you know, how do we identify this in our communities? How do we um, educate people on, on the potential risk? You know, I think fires didn't used to be a, a thing in the people's minds. And now they're like, oh my God, if I'm in, a, in an area where fire can reach me, then I'm very vulnerable. So what have you seen among these things? And I think I'm, I'm putting a lot of the questions that Rebecca is putting in our chat together. No problem. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, so I'll start with saying, like I said before, that um, equity and resilience go hand in hand. And if you think about mm -hmm. equity as, you know, um, community a a a engagement in terms of design, and you think about resilience in terms of like the future, like how do we prepare for the future? Um, it, it's, it come, becomes more apparent um, how to do that. So for example, um, I think it, it comes with, you know, let's talk about predictability. So there are things that we can predict in terms of, um, in terms of some accuracy, uh, like sea level rise, for example, you can, you can have projections of sea level rise. Um, but then there's things that you can't predict, like fires and like earthquakes. And that is what that is where um, equity and, and resilience collide, because like you were saying, uh, Alicia, like there are indigenous communities, for example, that have lived in areas and have been dealing with these natural disasters for uh, hundreds of years and know exactly how to deal with them. And when you have a developer coming in that's not from the area, for example, um, they could really learn by engaging the community and even becoming a hub when such a disaster hits so people have a place for safety, right? But also uh, in terms of things that you can't predict, um, really uh, that is where 
science and, and data and metrics are really helpful um, because not, not only just like demographic data, but also like uh, projections and, um, you know, uh, looking at material durability in terms of fires, for example. And um, so there is opportunities for, you know, project teams and developers to learn and be educated from the communities themselves. Um, but for the uh, issues that require, you know, metrics and assessment, that is where project teams can help community leaders uh, figure out what, how best to address these concerns. Um, so I think it's like a, a two way street where, uh, you know, project teams and, and those of us who are in the lead world, we can learn from the community as well as um, engaging them. And it all comes down to, you know, science communication, um, how best to engage communities, not just by like telling them numbers, but also uh, addressing their needs specifically, you know, how will they be able to get resources in a time of a disaster? Where, where can they go in the time of a disaster? Um, and you know those those times when disaster hits are are actually um, the best times to engage those communities and say like what happened how can we address this in the future um, and in in terms of COVID you know we learned a lot from COVID uh, we learned that you know uh, it's not just a public health issue but also an equity and resilience issue. Uh, and when we're talking about risk assessment and hazard assessment, we're also talking about, um, you know, uh, a disease outbreak. Um, so again, it goes back to community engagement where you see doing demographic assessments, seeing how vulnerable your community is, you know, how many seniors are in your community, how many children, um, you know, how many unvaccinated, um, looking at that data uh, to look at the risk of an outbreak is very much essential. And then looking at things like whether you're in a food desert, um, you know, how can resources be distributed in the event of a disaster? Um, you know, we saw a lot of changes in the supply chain. You know, we have a social equity supply chain credit. Um, you know, how can uh, the community rely on local goods and services? Um, how can you re regenerate resources so you don't have to rely on uh, foreign goods and services? These are all really important questions that show how much those two things go hand in hand. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I think we have great questions here, you know, also from Celeste, when community leaders get involved in project development, is it commonplace for their work to be um, remunerated by the developer? Or is it basically volunteering? I mean, people are volunteering all the time for, you know, getting together and putting resilience forward. Um, I can't speak to I any... Think it changes, right? Yeah. yeah. I can't speak to Sorry, any specific project that has done that. Um, I will say that project teams often find the most success when they create like a town hall type of situation, um, like an open public forum. Um, but uh, I, I know like it depends on the project team. Um, so it's really up to the project team what how they want to engage those leaders, you know. Um, there's also like when you're engaging community leaders, you're not just engaging civilians you're you can also be engaging uh like for example the local NAACP chapter or um you know community partners um that's where you where that can come in uh into play you know also in our social equity within the community pilot credit you know part of the requirements is to you know engage with partners and remunerate and um you know uh be able to fund the community while also funding the project. Um, and you can look at those requirements, but uh, it allows not only the project to prosper, but also the surrounding community. And like I was saying, like creating that 
local um, uh, good, uh, a, a, a conduit for local goods and services um, to thrive in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, can we share with us some of the benefits for adopting resilient resilient strategies? Like, what have you seen of the outcomes and benefits from that? Oh, that's a great question. Um, there's so many benefits. Um, you know, there's a triple bottom bottom line of benefits um, in terms of socially, financially, environmentally. Um, so. I would say that the, the obviously the the biggest benefit, like I was sharing the project in Puerto Rico, is experiencing a disaster and having a, a resilience hub, uh, a place for people to go um, to shelter. Um, that is a you know the gold standard of benefits in terms of resilient design. Um, but also, as we talk about positive and regeneration, um, that is. Uh, the goal, you know, um, as we talk more about the future of LEAD with our committees and with staff, we're thinking more about, you know, how can natural systems um, that run through the building uh, help the building function, how can they be connected in a way that's regenerative um, and in a way where you don't have to rely um, on the grid, you know, you don't when when the grid is compromised, uh, and and water systems and food systems, the supply chain when those are all compromised, how can a building function independently? You know, can a rainwater system be used to irrigate a um, green roof that also provides food to occupants? Um, and um, does the roof also have solar panels that power the building? So, um, as the sustain, I'm, all, I'm the, also the, the sustainer. Right. Yes, <laughs> creating synergy. Like tackling you know? the synergy. Yes. Yeah, you know, um, you uh, not using, uh, not creating parking spots, and instead creating um, a place. Islands. Yeah, exactly. Not creating heat islands. Instead, creating green infrastructure. You know, these are ways in which a, a building can truly become independent uh, and uh, locally uh, uh, supported. Um, and like I said, not, when when systems become compromised, like the grid and water systems and food systems and the supply chain, and and that in the face of that issue, they're able to function like nothing's happening. Right. Right. No. And I think a lot more people, especially communities, are realizing that there's a lot of power in integrating their strengths. You know, like before we thought that we could do it all by ourselves and then now we're realizing we have we have to live as a community and support each other and that's what it's gonna create more resilience. And as a building or a developer or a city, I think we have to create those connections within the community because we're not isolated. and I think climate change and everything that is happening has made us realize that we need a plan. We need a plan for resilience and that plan should be equitable because that is going to change how we experience in a, in a situation of crisis, right? So I don't know if there's any further questions from the odd audience. I, I really have enjoyed very much. Oh, thank you, Celeste. Is there a region in the U.S.? or in the world where you have noticed particular interest in resilience design? That's a really good question. Um, you know, uh, in the US, a lot of coastal areas are very yes. much interested in design um, and a lot of government projects, uh, uh, especially with the new administration uh, that has come to power. There is an, in, uh, you know, we're back into uh, the Paris Agreement, there's a lot more engagement and money being put into resilient design projects. Um, there are goals by the new administration to try to become, um, uh, uh, to, to address carbon. Um, so there is renewed focus and energy and momentum and motivation uh, federally in the US, 
but like you will see like in places like uh new york uh philadelphia new jersey yeah. california texas especially um <laughs> those uh areas uh are seeing a a lot of money and attention uh and projects um in terms of resilience um you know california we know has been going through insane fires the last couple of years um my uh capstone project for my um thesis and and grad school was surrounding you know hurricanes and uh texas uh, texas sees more billion dollar disasters than any other state so um uh, I think you'll see Tex Texas be uh, <laughs> a, 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 a big place where, uh, uh, where, where that's happening. Um, and also, you know, after um, uh, after the um, Hurricane Harvey in 2017, uh, there you can see after effects of disaster that cause public health concerns. So like in Texas, you saw flooding of sewer waters in the street. You saw, um, uh, because there's so much uh, development of, you know, fossil fuels and, and the oil industry in Texas, you see a lot of, um, there, there was uh, toxic flooding from um, those f fossil fuel chemicals and, and uh, chemical companies are also there. So there was a lot of public health concerns because you know, Houston was yeah, designed. Yeah, what happens then you realize, you know, the problem and want to tackle it. Right. Well, so there. Were... Sorry. No, that's 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 okay. Sorry, I just yeah. want to make sure that you answer my question before it's not too late. Um, <laughs> we know now that Arc has a new part for climate risk assessment, and you know, we want to know if that's working world worldly or is just us can we access that can we get that information to implement in our projects or is it coming or do you know do you know about this climate um climate risk for arc yeah so um i am unsure about whether we we did just introduce it so i'm unsure whether it expanded yes. globally we can answer that question uh offline uh we'll have an answer to you i'm sorry about that um Thank but you. yeah we, we're very excited about the new climate risk tools and um as well as like their uh the climate related financial disclosure tools um i know that arc uh actually no i'm, I'm finding out now yeah the new capabilities allow arc climate risk to serve as a global platform so uh yes it thank is, you great to understand the transition and physical risk perfect yeah so rebecca says that we are going to be preparing a webinar specifically specifically about that climate risk tool in arc so thank you so much um i don't i am very very happy and we are very grateful with gbci to present these things to Mexico sure. and really like understand. One more you know, uh, question one in the more chat. Question. Um, more um, developers are using resilience strategies to avoid negative financial impact. Can you develop on that? Oh um, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So uh, as we were saying before, there there are uh, financial benefits to becoming a more resilient building. Uh, like I was saying, in terms of like connecting natural systems. You can obviously see a lower um, lower energy costs if you are using solar energy, for example, uh, lower water uh, use and uh, water efficiency when you're using green infrastructure. So there are when you use resilient design strategies, um, those financial benefits are implicit. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions and people going into the um, lead pilot credit and realizing all the potential that we have using those credits are also going to be very interesting for our community. So yeah, we really want to encourage. 
sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I was going to say go we ahead, are. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yes, absolutely. We are currently looking at developing those pilot credits further. So if you have any uh, notes or want to address any concerns that you see from looking at those pilot credits, please uh, email me. We are uh, currently this year looking at um, uh, updating them. So please, again, reach out if you have any notes. Thank you. And that's, that's my, my thing. I wanted to invite everybody in Mexico or wherever you are to really participate with you at GDC. They're very open. And if you have things to benefit and put uh, the, the wisdom, in more wisdom into these pilot credits, they really want to understand what the communities have developed, what are the best strategies, what are the best practices. So participate in these credits too. I mean, I know uh, maybe you have learned a lot of things from the disasters in your area that you might want to put on. And um, UHBC is always open to get better. So thank you yeah, so I will much. Also, I will also say um, when we talk about resilience and we're talking about disasters, we're also talking about uh, any human caused events. So for example, terrorist attacks. So uh, when of you're course. looking at that, consider those as well. Right, right. Okay, thank you. This has been very, very good and very great conversation with you. And um, I want to thank everybody. And I don't know if Nicolette has some closing questions or uh, closing um, uh, words for everybody, but um, I, I really want to um, help everybody to participate, to understand these credits, to understand resilience, because that's going to make all our societies better. Nicolette, do you have closing words for no, us? No, thank, thank you. you. That was great, Alicia. Thank you so much, Kurima, for being with us today. Thank you all. I really thank appreciated this opportunity. And thank you, Alicia, for having me. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody who participated in this. This will be recorded for every one of you. And I hope you can keep coming to us for lead innovators this is really great information and we will continue our our job with the ubci and thank you very much karima for being here today thank you rebecca and thank you nicolette and everyone in the call thank you goodbye have a great day thank you all it's been my pleasure <laughs>